Okay, so part two of the low dimensional physics. We are entering deeper into the quantum transport. So uh, we kind of left uh, solid state physics, but then I wanted to spend these couple last weeks giving you some of the more advanced topics. And low dimensional systems is one of the forefront fascinating areas. So let's stick with it for another hour. So um, today we're going to discuss um, effects that are, can all be demonstrated and illustrated with this two-dimensional electron gas that I already talked about a couple of times. So just a reminder, um, it is a semiconductor crystal uh, which contains this hetero interface between two different semiconductors. Right? So you can grow it on a gallium arsenide substrate, and then you grow, actually, in reality, you grow quite a few different layers to accommodate strain and uh, make a really high quality uh, interface. But just think about it as a, as a substrate of gallium arsenide, and then you grow this aluminum gallium arsenide on top of it. And so here, um, on the side, I have for you a um, view top to bottom view of the uh, band diagram uh, of such a material showing just the edge of the conduction band. So the bottom of the conduction band plotted here. Um, and this is the interface point. It's right here. And at the interface, there is this kink in the conduction band, which for proper alignment of the other potentials, such as for the proper amount of uh, positively charged dopants here that donate uh, their electrons, the negatively charged electrons that fall into this quantum well. And for um, the appropriate position of the Fermi level, we can have just the uh, single subband occupied in, in this interface potential trap. Right? And now this is a top view on a three-dimensional crystal. So uh, this kink, this triangular well, corresponds to a two-dimensional free electron gas, uh, but constrained in one dimension. But in two dimensions, it's free. And here I show it by this sheet, by this blue sheet. Uh, so. Um, in a typical structure, this would be buried about 100 nanometers below the surface of the crystal. And so this will become important in this lecture, that it is not on the surface in this case, but it is buried underneath the surface. Uh, here are some typical numbers uh, for one of these two-dimensional electron gases. Uh, now, the first one is a density. Um, this density is at low temperature. Uh, and uh, so typically, a semiconductor would freeze out at low temperature because all the excitations across the band gap will become impossible. But in this case, there is this finite density, which is quite sizable, also persisting down to low temperature, where a lot of the quantum effects are observed. And this is because of the dopants that are put here. So these extra dopants. Uh, donate electrons that jump in and fall into the 2 deg, uh, even at zero temperature, they are not frozen out. Right? There is an excess uh, density. But uh, this is a relatively low density from the point of view of um, a metal, for example. So uh, in a metal, each atom donates an electron. And here, uh, maybe one atom per billion donates an electron. So the density is quite a bit reduced. Uh, and you can see that from the, the following uh, energy scales here. So, for example, Fermi energy is tens of milli electron volts here. And this can be just calculated from the two dimensional uh, physics that we discussed last time. So, how many uh, states are filled, and uh, all the states inside the Fermi area are 
uh, field, and th this will give you the Fermi energy, which is just a fraction of the Fermi energy that you can have uh, in a metal. Uh, and that also uh, means that uh, these particles have a long Fermi wavelength. So you can calculate the Fermi wavelength by um, taking something like uh, some h bar divided by Fermi velocity. Uh, and this Fermi wavelength is tens of nanometers. Uh, you can think of it as the size of the wave function of an electron. And uh, that re the scale on which single wave, single electron wave properties should manifest. Right? So tens of nanometers means thousands of uh, lattice sites, a thousand lattice sites or so, uh, is one electron, right? And then thousand by thousand by thousand in three dimension tells you what's the doping uh, corresponding to the number of the total number of atoms. Um, okay, so then um, what is also important is that these structures are very ballistic. Um, so ballistic regime means that there is a very long mean free path, and this you can get by really carefully engineering these semiconductors to be, for example, by removing these dopants and not doping the uh, kink itself, but putting them a few nanometers away helps a lot. Um, and uh, for very high mobility structures, you can have these mean free paths of tens of microns, which is, means millions of lattice sites you fly without scattering. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is uh, important, going to be important for today. Um, another thing I'm going to introduce today uh, is uh, gates. And these are metals placed on top of the crystal now. So uh, two-dimensional electron gases 100 nanometers below. And these are metallic structures which can be nano-fabricated to also be of nanoscale dimensions. For example, uh, this gap can be uh, for example, 200 nanometers or, or something like this. Um, in this case, when there are two gates with a gap, this is called a split gate configuration. But if you imagine just having a single gate going all the way across this two deg, this is what you can do with a gate. So you have a conductor, which is a two-dimensional sheet, 100 nanometers below. Now imagine you apply negative voltage to this golden, uh, which is uh, also often made of gold, so that's why the color, golden gate. Uh, so uh, negative potential on the gate will repel electrons from underneath. And uh, you can think of it as a capacitor. If you, you induce a negative charge on the gate, that will induce a positive charge on the 2-deg, but the 2-deg, E in the 2-deg stands for electrons, so it's full of negative charges, so it's like removing electrons from the 2-deg. So uh, adding uh, positive charges like removing electrons from the 2-deg. And if you uh, have a gate going all the way across for a very, very negative potential on that gate, you can separate the 2-deg in two parts, in front of the gate and behind the gate. And those two regions will be unconnected because in between there will be a region of depleted of electrons. Think of the PN junction. Remember, there was a depletion region there. This is what you can get with a, with a gate um, in the 2-deg. And this is also how you can make a field effect transistor out of a 2-deg. Right? So one single gate that cuts all the way across. Of course, you need to connect the front region of the 2-deck and the back region of the 2-deck to some charge reservoirs so the charge can come and go. Otherwise, the charge will have nowhere to go and uh, will not be removed from underneath the gate. But um, this is how you can build devices with gates. And we already seen this uh, in uh, semiconductor devices a little bit. But now for the split gate device, um, I'm going to apply a negative voltage uh, to this gate, and uh, I am going to deplete the region underneath the gate uh, of electrons like I described it to you, and that will produce these uh, imprints of the split gate in the two-dimensional electron gas. And inside these red lines, 
there will be no electrons. There will be no electrons, but the constriction is so small that it's on the order of the wavelength. It's tens of nanometers. So only one, two, three wavelengths of an electron in this deck fit through this constriction. Okay. And this structure is then called the quantum point contact. So this is our first topic of the day. And this is a wonderful example of a one-dimensional system. And this is great because this one-dimensional system we can fully control by electrostatics. We can, in principle, change its width, although it's strange to talk about the width of a one-dimensional system, but we can. I'll explain to you in what sense we can change the width. We can also, in principle, change the length. So it's a fully controlled system based on a two-deck. All right. So, uh, but in essence, it's a constriction between uh, inside a, a conductor. And uh, let's um, talk about what uh, transfer of charge across a constriction uh, can look like from the most uh, basic considerations. Okay? Uh, so if we want to transfer charge through a constriction, here it's a Another example of a point contact, which is not necessarily quantum, but uh, this one's called Charvin, after a physicist who studied it. Uh, and uh, uh, the key property of Charvin point contact is that it's very ballistic, meaning that there is this ballistic region where there is very little scattering for electrons. Right? So they can fly through, like in our two deg, for 10 microns, electrons fly without scattering. Uh, and then uh, to pass a current through this constriction, we better connect um, this constriction into an electrical circuit, which will we can uh, understand as having some contacts to the to the two deck to the two dimensional electron gas, some contacts, and a, a hook it up to a battery. Um, and this would um, look like this: we will have a region next to the left contact to the first contact, where electrons will be equilibrated to some. Um, chemical potential mu1. So this chemical potential will be uh, whatever their um, Fermi energy is there uh, in part one plus E times V, uh, for example. So if the voltage difference is V, then this will be the chemical potential mu1. Um, and then uh, on, the, on the other side, it will be, for example, EF plus 0. I think I had it flipped because the diagram shows voltage going in the other direction. But you get the point. Right. So, the, so the electrons will have different uh, Fermi levels raised by the voltage, by the uh, electric potential applied to the circuit. Uh, now, uh, these electrons bounce around from the contact, and then they approach the constriction, uh, which is uh, in the middle of a very ballistic region. And then uh, one of these electrons with the chemical potential mu1 uh, just uh, flies through the constriction uh, as a billiard, as a ball uh, which uh, may reflect but does not change its energy. That's the definition of ballistic does not change its energy even though it bounces off these walls, so it uh, bounces elastically. does not change its energy. And therefore, you can see the red arrow here. It arrives to the other side of the constriction with the same potential mu1. It did not lose its energy, so it arrives with that potential. Uh, it will then dissipate and lose its potential, uh, its energy in this uh, on its way to contact two, but it crosses through the constriction without losing energy. So that's one of the key uh, concepts for today, and that's why ballistic is important. There are also other trajectories uh, which do not lead across the constriction, but can uh, scatter you back, and that's, that's the role of the constriction. So not all the electrons that fly from the direction of contact one will make it across the constriction. Some will be reflected. And the fraction of those is given by the width 
of the constriction relative to the sample size and so on. So the width of the constriction plays a role here. Um, and then there are also electrons with, marked with blue arrows which go from right to the left. Now those electrons have a lower energy. They have a lower chemical potential uh, in, my, in my notation anyways. Uh, but they still uh, they have random velocities as they uh, leave the contact area and some of them will fly across the constriction in the opposite direction while having a potential mu 2. And now those electrons um, will subtract from the current because right? they're going in the opposite direction. So there are processes where you go across this way, across the other way, and you can also backscatter. And if we want to calculate current, we need to count all these processes in. And that's how uh, transport calculations work. Uh, and we've already done some of these calculations. For example, we've done the Drude model. Uh, but this is now sort of looking at the atom of transport, one single constriction and how uh, electrons uh, go across it. So in this sense, it's a, and I will show you how you can build up transport for any conductor based on, based on this idea of splitting it into essentially small constrictions. Okay, so um, nonetheless, uh, the chemical potential difference, eventually electrons do lose their energy, although not in the ballistic region, but outside. Uh, and so the energy difference uh, is then given by uh, EV. And conductance is given by current divided by this uh, voltage that we apply. Okay, so the question is, uh, of course, how to calculate this current. Well, in a two-dimensional electron gas at low temperature, let's not calculate it first, but let's uh, see what people have measured. This was actually measured in uh, Delft in Holland on November 30th, 1987. I've got these slides from the guy who measured this, this curve. This is a very famous experiment. Actually, I think this is not a proper slide. This is a you know, this transparency with, a, with this transparency machine scanned into a PowerPoint. But I still love to show this one rather than uh, I have many glorified versions of, this, of these curves, but I, I really enjoy showing these. Um, and so what does this show? It shows uh, resistance, which is then, okay, uh, voltage divided by current or conductance uh, for one of these constrictions made in a two-dimensional electron gas, just like I explained it to you. Uh, and now what's on the x-axis? It's the gate voltage. Right? So it's a, in this experiment, they just applied the same voltage on the two gates, on the split gate. Um, and uh, they started with a uh, more positive voltage, and then they made it more and more negative, and resistance increases. Right? So let's first understand this overall increase. Uh, that is relatively uh, easy to understand. Um, as you make the gate voltage more negative, you are closing the constriction. So because you have these two gates, and this is your two deg, and the electric field not only goes straight down, but it also spreads, spreads out from the tips of the gates. And as you make it more and more negative, you shrink the constriction. And as you shrink it, more and more electrons bounce back. They, they, the fraction of those that go across, those trajectories shrinks, and so current drops. And for the same potential difference, for the same voltage, you get a higher resistance. So that's the overall uh, envelope here. Um, and um, there is a formula for this, Sharvin formula, which includes this one over width uh, factor, which is the width, is the width of the constriction. And this is what we are observing here. At first glance, it's 1 over width. Uh, but then there are also, of course, uh, these uh, wiggles. Uh, these wiggles that then at lower gate voltage, at more negative gate voltage, become distinct steps, steps in resistance. Um, and then these steps also become equidistant if we invert 
the vertical scale and plot now conductance. And you have already seen such steps in the quantum Hall regime, right? And they were quantized in the units of e squared over h. In this case, actually in the units of 2 e squared over h. Uh, so the, the, he marked here the distance between the points is 2 e squared over h. And they were able to observe quite a few of these steps. Right, so let's discuss these steps uh, in more detail now. So like I told you, uh, we already seen something like this in the integer quantum hole effect. And what I told you um, very briefly at the end of that lecture uh, was that um, these steps come from the fact that when you have a, a specimen, a true deg, in large magnetic field, you have these uh, skipping orbit trajectories going on the, uh, along the edges of the system. Uh, and in the quantum limit, uh, they just become wave functions that are bound to the edge and form kind of one-dimensional channels. And then if you have several Landau levels occupied, that's like having several of these running along each edge for the proper uh, choice of uh, voltage and magnetic field. And I told you that each one of them contributes um, e squared over h to conductance. So now let's derive this. So this is something that is in common between the uh, integer quantum hole regime and this point <coughs> contact regime, right? This seems to be the same, the same observation, so it would be good to understand where this comes from. All right, so we are in the ballistic regime, and moreover, we're in the quantum regime. We are at low temperature, and the constriction is of the size of the wavelength. So in the ballistic regime, um, like I already highlighted it to you, I'm not going to derive it, but uh, basically conductance is, um, can be derived to be proportional to some prefactor, which combines these fundamental constants. Um, and this, this factor, which contains the uh, width of the constriction and the number of the wavelengths. And so the, you can see that in this ballistic but still classical regime, uh, you can have any conductance you want. As you continuously change the width of the constriction, conductance will increase, uh, resistance will uh, decrease. Now, uh, we know what to expect in the quantum limit of this situation. Uh, when the width is of the order of the Fermi wavelength, so the wavelength of electrons, um, then uh, we know that it's equivalent to some kind of a particle in the box uh, problem, right? So what is, the, what is the box here? It's a box of width w. We are already constrained in the z direction because we are in the two deg. So we already constrain ourselves in two directions, in the z direction and in the uh, direction x, which is uh, transverse here. Now, we still have a one direction unconstrained, which is along through the constriction. So this is a particle in a uh, box problem where uh, energy levels that are quantized are in the xz box. Or if we just start with a 2D uh, case, forget about z, then it's a uh, box in the x direction. And that's going to give us some quantized energies, one, two, three. Um, and uh, the statement is that if you take this formula and fit it here, then when, when the width is uh, exactly equal to certain values, Right? When, when this ratio W divided by lambda F is integer, or half integer, um, then uh, conductance will be 
uh, will reach exactly these step values, right? So I'm just going to say uh, W here is equal to 1 lambda F. And if that is exactly the case, then um, conductance will be um, exactly, uh, exactly quantized. Uh, now it is uh, still, uh, you can figure out what the energy should be for this particle in the box problem for a certain W. Uh, you're going to get a, a certain uh, energy and you can say, well, if one mode is exactly one mode is occupied, uh, then uh, you will have uh, this conductance based on this formula. Okay. So this leaves a lot of, uh, there are some gaps uh, in this kind of argument. What if conductance is in between? What if uh, uh, I increase W to be not the integer number of the wavelengths but something else? Right. This, this will not make sense. So actually this, we can get the quantized values for the exact ratios of this, but we cannot get we cannot eliminate all other values. So we cannot produce steps as a result. So we need to do a more careful calculation. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do that. Um, well, first thing, we, we're going to um, make some realistic uh, assumptions here. Uh, one is, uh, OK, nomenclature first. Uh, so there is a left reservoir, right reservoir, y is along the constriction, and x is transverse. We can apply source drain voltage, and we're going to measure current that's going through, and we're going to calculate this current. Now, first thing that um, we can uh, safely assume is that uh, the confining potential in this x direction is not a sharp function. It's not really a particle in a square box with infinite walls, or sharp walls. Uh, it is some kind of a soft confinement, which we can uh, approximate as a parabolic confinement. And that's because, again, you have this split gate and the two deck underneath. And the uh, electric field lines uh, spread from the ends of the gate in this direction uh, and uh, gently, uh, gradually deplete so the wave function is confined like this. So this is shown in red um, on the transparency. Uh, and then in blue sh is shown the um, one of the eigenstates. So if we say that it's a parabola, then we know exactly what the spectrum is going to be, right? There will be equidistant levels. And the spectrum will be that of a harmonic oscillator, <coughs> because that's a particle in a parabolic potential. So in this uh, uh, reasonable and safe assumption, uh, the spectrum of one-dimensional subbands uh, in this wire is that of a harmonic oscillator. So uh, there will be some kind of a wave functions. The first subband will look like this. The second one will look like this. The third one will look like this, and so on. That's in a transverse direction. What about in the longitudinal direction? What will be the dispersion relation? <coughs> so in, in the x direction, we have this confinement, which is a parabola. So we have these solutions of the harmonic oscillator. What, what's gonna, what is going to look like in this direction? It's ballistic, yeah. So, but from the quantum mechanical point of view. So there's no confinement in this direction. Free particle. So so if I if I plot these E zero, E one, E two levels here, and this axis will be KY. And this is obviously energy. What it's going to look like? For okay, here is zero k. Free particle. Somebody said. 
Right, but what's going to be the dispersion relation? For a free particle? Well, cone is for certain band structures, like in graphene. Right, these are a bunch of parabolas, right? So this is a, it's actually written here. This is the y term. So, but it's, it's going to be several parabolas, right? So you can have uh, a certain energy in the x direction, which will be like an energy offset. You can be in the E0 mode in the x direction. You can be in the E1 mode, E2, E3, whatever. Uh, but then uh, in y, you're going to have uh, this kind of dispersion relation. So uh, last lecture, we already mentioned this briefly, and we called these subbands, right? <coughs> so this is because each looks like a band, uh, but they are subbands because they live in the band structure of a semiconductor somewhere. They arise due to some confinement uh, imposed on the electrons as waves, wave packets, um, in the, in, already inside the band structure. Okay, so this is going to be our uh, description for this confine, uh, confine, uh, constraint, uh, constriction. Sorry. So there's going to be several subbands, uh, and each subband is a one-dimensional subband, so meaning corresponds to a free propagation in the y direction and confinement in the x and also in z direction. So here is a spectrum drawn. Uh, um, on a transparency. Um, and now we're going to ask ourselves uh, what's the current going to be like if we apply a chemical potential difference across this constriction. This is where the fact that it's ballistic comes to play. And uh, the way you can see it is that uh, for all of the uh, momenta in the positive direction, so here's ky is 0. For all of the momenta, and say in the positive direction, all of those electrons are going to have chemical potential mu2. That's because it's ballistic, and they have nowhere to give their energy to. So they start from reservoir number 2 with a positive momentum, and they just go uh, until they cross the constriction with that momentum. They don't change their momentum. Uh, and, sorry, they, don't, they can change their momentum, but they don't change their energy, okay? their chemical potential. Uh, and for the ones uh, with a negative uh, 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 KY, likewise, the uh, chemical potential is going to be mu1. And uh, for this chosen setting of these potentials, they cut across two of these one-dimensional subbands. So... That means some of the electrons in this transverse wave function are occupied, and some of the electrons in this transverse wave function uh, are occupied. Okay. So all the red states are empty, and the green states are occupied, and the chemical potential difference is EV. Okay. So how do you calculate current? Well, you just start with the definition of current, that it's the number of electrons times their charge times their velocity. So we can, uh, we certainly know um, all of these things. Um, so let's put electron charge outside the, the bracket. And then this sum here is the sum over the transverse subbands. Right? We're going to do the calculation separately in each subband, and then we're going to add it up. So for example, the, for n equal 1, we're going to look at the bottom parabola, and I'm going to calculate current for that. And then for n equal 2, we're going to look at the second parabola. And all the others will give us 0, all the higher ones in this, for this particular case. right? But the formula is general. OK, so then uh, we need to know how many electrons are there. Okay. So we can just say that there are n, or dn, uh, or um, 
or we can use our knowledge of the density of states, which we already derived last time, right? Look at the green curve here. That's the density of states for exactly this system, for a one-dimensional uh, constricted system. Uh, it has this peculiar density of states, which if we integrate it in energy, will tell us how many electrons we have. So then we take this integral in uh, chemical potential from mu2 to mu1. And uh, you can see by the structure of this integral that it's just dE divided by dE, right? So it's, it was an integral of dN, but we made it an integral over energy. But what we've gained here is this density of states, which we know, which we've derived last time. It's this divergent function with Van Hove singularities, right? with these things. OK, and then it's times uh, Vn. That's the velocity of electrons uh, in each subband. And uh, Tn is uh, some factor of order unity, which is transmission. So we can account for imperfect transmission, because maybe some electrons are bouncing back not making it across. That's where we account for those things. Transmission is finite. So when transmission is 1, uh, it means that 100% uh, of electrons go through. When transmission is 0, it means they all bounce back, never make it from mu1 to mu2. Okay? That's, that's what those t's are. And in general, we can allow them to be different for each of the one-dimensional modes, for each of the subbands. Okay. So the one-dimensional density of states <coughs> we derived last time, but maybe not in this form. But it happens to be this uh, inverse derivative of uh, the dispersion relation. This is how you can get these Van Hove singularities. You can see that very clearly. So um, the function of E of k is a parabola. It's a parabola. And now if we take a, a derivative of d dk, sorry, uh, dE dk, that's going to go to 0 at the bottom of the parabola. Right? So now the inverse of the derivative, dk dE, is going to diverge. That's going to diverge at the bottom of the parabola. And that's how you get the Van Hove singularity. Okay? That's another way of, of seeing that. All right. And we also know that the velocity is actually d dk to the first power, not inverted. Right? That's just from you know, energy being mv squared. So velocity is some kind of proportion to the first power, to the, the first derivative of energy, uninverted. OK, so let's look at this integral now. Now we have density of states times velocity. And one of them is proportional to the uh, inverse derivative, d dk. And the other one is proportional to the derivative itself. So that's very lucky, right? because they kind of cancel out. So density of states times the velocity is just a constant. Drops out all the dependence on k, on energy, all drops out. It's just a constant. Right? It's a beautiful result. Um, and so this integral is just, this gives us current, this integral is just mu1 minus mu2. That's all. Time is a constant. Okay, so current is proportional to the difference in the chemical potential. Of course, the more the difference, the more electrons can go across. And that, that's why the current grows. Uh, but then it's just this, this constant. <coughs> and then times the sum of all these transmissions. So conductance is given by 2e squared over h 
times the sum of transmissions of all the modes, of all the su one-dimensional subbands. And if they're all one, if all the transmissions are one and we have a perfectly ballistic system, then this sum simply becomes the number of modes, just the nc. And conductance is equal to nc times 2 squared over h. So this is actually uh, a result that you can apply to any conductance. It's called landauer boutiquer formalism. Uh, and in this formalism, you can think about any conductor, any arbitrary shape conductor, uh, as having n modes. So let's say it's a large conductor, and then you split it into regions. Each little region is the size of the wavelength. And you can imagine that an arbitrary shape large conductor contains a large, very large number of one-dimensional modes. Okay? And then the conductance of that conductor will be n times this number of modes when it's a perfect ballistic conductor. Now you can then make this theory a little bit more complicated, allow the channels to scatter into each other, allow finite transmission. Uh, and then um, in language of these kind of conductance per channel being 2 squared over h times some scattering transmission matrix, you can describe any process of electrons traveling through any, any kind of material. So this is, a, this is a very useful formalism. And not just as a computational tool, which it is also nice uh, for those people who want to do this kind of calculations, but just at a conceptual level for you to hold this picture in your head, right, that you can think about conductance in this quantum way, that there is, uh, let's say, in a millimeter size of copper, there will be a billion of one-dimensional modes uh, of electrons, and they travel through, uh, through this piece of copper. Okay, so back in back to Delft to 1988, uh, they have also measured other stuff. For example, they uh, have warmed up their cryostat, and not much. They went from 0.3 Kelvin to 4.2 Kelvin in this experiment, and they have seen, they have observed that this conductance uh, quantization. Uh, which manifests as pretty distinct um, and fairly robust steps at zero temperature, at low temperature, washes out. And you cannot really speak about fixed quantized values of conductance at 4 Kelvin. You can still trace these bumps. You can still see that they're there at 4 <coughs> Kelvin, but they're not so distinct. So what happens here? Why did this happen? Any guesses? So somehow this landauer boutiquer quantum picture of 2 squared over h per channel uh, very easily fails and becomes more complicated. We crank up the temperature. So it's maybe a little difficult to think about the constriction uh, at finite temperature because we just talked about it being a kind of a particle in a box situation. Uh, but let's talk about the reservoirs. Right? So reservoirs are objects familiar to you. You can think of them as metals. Maybe it's a two-dimensional metal or a three-dimensional metal. Uh, doesn't matter. So. It's a, it's a gas of fermions. And what happens when we increase temperature? To the gas of fermions? Can we say that all electrons that uh, travel through this constriction have exact same energy? Right? Like, like our cartoon was that here we have mu1, and here we have 
mu 2, right? And assuming that all the states below mu 1 are filled and all the states above mu 1 are empty. Now what happens at finite temperature? It smears out, right? So there will be some electrons here above mu 1 and there will be some missing, missing states. There will be some holes below, right? And it will look like a Fermi distribution, right? Uh, and this is essentially what, in, in short, what's responsible for this smearing. We can see how that comes about. So here is a Fermi distribution, here denoted by letter F, which is also a very common way of, of doing that. And this is the same uh, uh, calculation for current, current being N times E times uh, velocity. Uh, but now, um, rather than integrating from mu1 to mu2, we integrate over the entire energy range, and uh, we have to take into account not only the density of states, but also the occupation of those states. Right? So um, in this calculation, uh, they already took care of that cancellation between the density of states and velocity. So we have this 2e divided by h all, already outside of the integral. But now to take into account the fact that there are some states with energies below mu1 and uh, above mu1 and some states with energy uh, below mu2, uh, we replace this sharp cutoff mu1 to mu2 to, with these Fermi distributions. And uh, one of them corresponds to FL, the left moving particles have one center of uh, symmetry for this distribution. Fermi energy plus EV, and the other one is just energy. And that's FR for the right moving particles. Right? So left and right moving particles have uh, different energies, but uh, at finite temperature we have to say that they have different Fermi distributions shifted by a certain energy. So this is how it looks um, in reality. So for particles that move from left to right, uh, we, ha we have this kind of situation. For particles from moving right to left, we have a different, with different chemical potential. And then inside the constriction, they coexist to form this kind of a distribution which is not Fermi, but this is some kind of a distribution function uh, with a double step. And at finite uh, temperature, we have to broaden this step and it, it's going to look like this. Now how do we take this integral? Uh, well, we can make some approximation. We can expand the Fermi function in the powers of EV, so working in the so-called linear response, meaning for small bias, EV. We can expand this function and then it will, uh, this integral will be approximately given by the integral over this derivative of dfde, which is this function. This is the derivative of the Fermi distribution. And the width of this uh, DFDE function is 3.5 kBT. So it's of the order of kT, but it's 3.5. And so this, this gives you the temperature scale for which the uh, quantized conductance effects are going to be gone, going to be washed out, and uh, the subbands will not be resolved anymore. All right. Here is another thing you can do with these quantized conductance steps. Um, in this uh, work, they have applied a large magnetic field, many Tesla. And what they've observed is that in place of uh, steps, they've observed half steps. So the number of steps doubled. And this is due to a, a trivial effect that each of the black steps contains actually two subbands, not one. And that's because we have fermions and they have spin one half. So at zero field, we actually have 
for each subband, we have a spin up, and immediately on top of that, we have another one with a spin, spin down. And this is actually what is responsible for the factor 2 in the 2 square, e squared over h. Uh, actually, each quantum channel gives you just e squared over h of conductance. And here, you, in fact, have two of them. Now, what happens at finite field, large enough field? These two become split in energy. And so for there, you can see that there could be values of chemical potential or uh, constriction width gate, gate setting, constriction width, for which uh, only one of the subbands is crisscrossed by the chemical potentials. Um, and this is what gives you this step. What is interesting about, in particular, this, this first step is that it corresponds to having only a single spin channel, let's say spin down the way I drew it, uh, available for crossing the quantum point contact. So it means that spin up, the other spin, is not allowed to go. Only spin down is allowed to go across. So by sending some current through this kind of quantum point contact, you are creating a spin polarized current. In principle, 100% spin polarized current can be created this way. So you filter out all the other spins and only let uh, the lower energy spin go through. So this is how you can make a spin uh, device, a spin diode. All right. That's what I wanted to tell you about one-dimensional systems. And uh, what I told you once again, it also largely applies to quantum hole regime. Um, now let's look back at our 2DAG. So in this diagram, blue color is the color of uh, the layer of two-dimensional electrons. Uh, and these are actually contacts that we have to make from the surface by annealing some metals so that we can pass current through inject some electrons from outside. Uh, but then we go into this blue layer, which is about 100 nanometers below the surface. And the yellow structures on top are the gates. And now in this three-dimensional uh, view, you can see that I can make all kinds of shapes uh, with these gates. And applying negative potentials to them, I can deplete the 2 deg uh, to make all kinds of constrictions. So for example, on the upper side of the plot. Here I have a couple of what looks like quantum point contacts. Right? So then um, the shadows of these gates are the depleted regions, the, the pink colors. Uh, and so here, going through here, underneath this big yellow gate, um, I can have a one-dimensional uh, structure there. But now in here, there are enough gates coming from all directions that I can also make a zero dimensional system. I can deplete a little um, droplet of two dimensional electrons and cut it off from the rest. So these two items here, for example, here is one and then there's one right next to it, are these kind of one dimensional islands. And you can see that they have uh, perhaps you see they have a funny shape here where they are um, still somewhat connected to the reservoirs. So for example, this could be the mu1 and this could be the mu2. Um, and uh, they are not fully pinched off there. <coughs> In fact, there may be a tunneling barrier between mu1 and one of these islands. And these kind of islands, we can call them quantum dots um, or in, in essence, they're charge islands where the size of the island is also of the order of the wavelength of an electron. And so it is really like a particle in a three-dimensional box confined in all three dimensions. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, nice 
physics you can do with this, um, which is very easy to understand. You just basically need to know electrostatics and particle in the box quantum mechanics. Okay. All right, so let's uh, get electrostatics out of the way first, because uh, whenever you uh, confine charges in all three dimensions, uh, you have to worry about capacitance effects. And that's because capacitance uh, uh, becomes very small, and that means that charging energy becomes very large. So charging energy uh, is, for one electron, is e squared over 2c. When c is very small, then this energy scale can become significant, can become very large. Okay? So we are going to um, think about these kind of systems for the rest of the class today. Uh, this will be a quantum dot. It will be coupled to two reservoirs, right? because we will be, again, interested in passing current. So they will be our mu1 and mu2. And uh, we will... Um, connect them by, in this case, they look like these resistors to R each, but they will actually be tunneling barriers. The, the electrons cannot just go across. They will have to tunnel through an NN tunneling barrier. So there will be N, insulator, N. And in a two-deck, you can realize it like I just showed you by pinching off the split gate uh, quite a bit, but not all the way to weakly couple the reservoir to the quantum dot on each side. And we're going to use this kind of notation. So a resistor with a cut, box with a cut, to show the tunneling, tunneling barrier. OK, so when the island is isolated, then obviously we can put the integer number of charges on it. We cannot put uh, 3 and a half, which has to be n times e. Uh, and that means that you can calculate the full energy of an island, which is e squared times n squared divided by 2c. Or if we call this ec, the charging energy, like I just introduced for you, then it's EC times N squared. So the energy related to uh, charge on an island grows quadratically with the number of uh, charges. So what are some of the typical energies that we could encounter? So let's say a 100 nanometer uh, island, right? I told you the wavelength in the 2 deg is 50 to 50 nanometers. So this is of the order of the wavelength in a 2 deg. Um, then we can have, um, in a metal, when each atom contributes an electron, 10 to the 9 electrons in this volume of 100 nanometers. And then the charging energy uh, is uh, actually fairly small. because the capacitance is very large in this case. OK, so uh, if we don't have much electrons, uh, then um, the charging energy can be, uh, sorry, what is this? Oh, sorry, uh, this is the, um, sorry, I'm, I skipped one, one logic step here. Uh, this delta here is the, uh, the energy, the kinetic energy, that uh, having these uh, 10 to the 9 electrons on an island gives you. Okay? So that's very small. Uh, and we can neglect it, in fact. So there are so, uh, so few electrons on the island that their kinetic energy is very small. But the charging energy can be significant because it's of the scale of uh, electric charge divided by the capacitance, which is um, proportional to the size of the island. So capacitance is proportional to uh, the size of the island. Uh, and the charging energy for a 100 nanometer island uh, can be about a millivolt, and that's uh, much larger than uh, what would be the Fermi energy of this small number of particles.
Okay, sorry a bit for the mix up. Okay. So I told you that there has to be an integer number of electrons, obviously, on an island. But uh, I'm going to introduce something uh, which is, uh, can be thought of as an induced charge. And this comes from this kind of an electrical circuit. So uh, in this circuit, this part here is our island. So this is a small volume of a two deg, for example. Um, this part here is a gate, which is connected to some battery. And the other side of the battery is hooked up to the two deg. So this is the reservoir R, which has a potential mu. So this is the other part of the two deg outside of the dot. And, and this is the tunneling junction. Tunnel junction. So then we know exactly, uh, it's a very simple electrostatic problem, we know exactly how to calculate it, that the total charge of the jun on the junction is, uh, you have to add up charge uh, from this capacitor which is uh, formed by the island with a gate, and you can model this tunnel barrier as another capacitor, uh, so um, plus the charge induced by that. So QG plus QR. And now you also have capacitance to the reservoir, CR, and capacitance to the gate, CG. The total capacitance is the sum uh, of these two capacitances because they both go to a fixed potential outside. Um, now, what does this mean? Uh, if we introduce VI, which is the potential on the island, then uh, uh, charge... Um, on the gate is equivalent to the potential difference between the island and the gate times that capacitance and charge on the reservoir is uh, VI because it's VI minus zero. Zero is the potential of the reservoir in this calculation. Um, and regrouping this just gives us C times VI, which is the um, charge on the island, but then minus this CG times VG term, which can be uh, thought of as an induced charge from the gate. Right? And in principle, C times VI, uh, this charge has to be quantized. It has to be equal to the number N. Uh, but this CG times VG, this can be anything because we can vary VG continuously. So this is the concept of the induced charge from the external, from the external potential. Okay. So this is how uh, the situation looks from the point of view of the electrostatic energy. Um, so here's the same circuit. Let's say we are at zero here, which means that uh, we have zero electrons on this island. The number of electrons is quantized, so we can put zero electrons on this island. Um, then, uh, due to the induced charge, we can still have this parabolic capacitive energy. Here's a calculation down here. Um, so, the work needed to ramp up the potential across CG, uh, across the capacitor to the gate, uh, is equivalent to this, and this can be rewritten as this, which has n electrons on the island. Here n is equal to zero, then Cg times Vg, which is this in ch charge induced by the gate, which is a continuous variable, and this gives us this parabola. Now you can see that there are two terms here, and there, there, is, uh, there is a minus sign between them, which uh, means that you can uh, lower your energy by, at some point, adding an electron to the island, rather than keep ramping up this induced potential, this external potential from the gate. 
Um, and this electron, where can it come from? It can, this electron can hop across the tunneling barrier. So there will be a building up potential on the island and an electron will hop on and lower the overall energy. And so in fact, you will evolve along this blue curve as you change the gate. Um, it will become favorable to have first zero electrons on the island, then one, then two, then three, then four, um, and so on. And in principle, this situation is symmetric, so you, you can also have minus one and minus two, but in practice, you may not have, uh, you're going to subtract electrons from uh, zero electrons, Dorbany. Okay. So is this, is this more or less clear? So it's an isolated island. It's coupled by a tunneling barrier to a reservoir. And we're changing the gate potential. And what it means is that uh, you can minimize energy by uh, adding charge to this island. Okay. Now what is interesting from the point of view of uh, transport here is the effect that is called the Coulomb blockade. And this is how Coulomb blockade works. Now I'm going to connect my island to two reservoirs, like in the first picture. So mu1, quantum dot, mu2. And the gate will be somewhere here, also capacitively coupled to the island. So it's a kind of a three-terminal uh, situation here. And um, I am going to be concerned with the chemical potentials again, right? Because the chemical potential, what the role of it is, is that uh, it tells you how much energy you need to have to add an electron to part of the system. And so we already know what the source and the drain chemical potentials look like. This is, again, at zero temperature. So all the states below are occupied. All the states above are empty. Now, what about this uh, island uh, in the middle? It has a discrete uh, staircase of chemical potentials. And so the way to calculate that is to take the difference between the energy of having n electrons and the energy of having n minus 1 electrons. That will tell you how much energy you need to add one electron, the nth electron to this system. And if you look back here, uh, for a given value of uh, gate voltage here, you can have a very different values for this uh, difference between u uh, n and u n minus 1. So the red one will be u of n, because we're fixing n here, and we're varying the gate. So that will be u of n. And then the next parabola over will be u of n minus 1. And the parabola to the other side will be u of n plus 1. So that will be the energy difference that you need to come up with to add an electron to the island. And so um, this is what it looks like in terms of the external potential uh, and uh, uh, the number of electrons on the island. So for a certain value of the external potential, uh, you may have a situation where the chemical potential to add an elect nth electron to the system is below the Fermi level in the source and drain. And the chemical potential to add the second one is above. And your source and drain chemical potentials are in between. Now, OK, so uh, imagine you are in this situation. You have an electron here which, which has the exact energy you need to go across. So that guy goes across. And now this state has n electrons. This island has n electrons. And that uh, level is blocked. You cannot put more electrons and still have n equal the same. right? So you can only increase n by 1. And then you don't have enough energy to do that. Okay? So you cannot add one more electron. OK, now what happens to this electron? Now this guy is here. It is stuck. 
it cannot go forward because all the states are filled on the other side. To go out, he needs to come up with this much energy, and this is not allowed. Okay. So in this sense, uh, this is called Coulomb blockade because due to charging effects, due to not having enough energy to overcome uh, the charging energy, you shut off the transfer of current through this device. Okay. So in, uh, what is dramatic about this effect is that one single electron can shut down current through a circuit. Okay. Of course, it happens when the circuit is pretty small. But still, it's impressive. It, uh, it can still happen when you have thousands of electrons on this island already. When n is 1,000, this can still happen. So this is how then a current voltage characteristic looks. Um, you have this state with no current, which is a blockade. But then uh, above a certain threshold, current increases again. Why is that? It's because you increase the voltage, which is the source drain difference. Okay? So when you make source drain uh, very far apart, a couple of things can happen. First of all, you can reach this higher level with a source. So if you crank up the source until you reach the next one with n plus 1 electrons, then this electron here from the source level can hop on. That's OK. It has enough energy to do that. And then it can hop off and go into the ground. And the current will actually flow because there is plenty of available states for that electron to keep going uh, through the device. So when you hit this upper chemical potential, current onsets. Right? The same thing will happen if you lower the drain to, to go below this level. Right? Current will be allowed. Okay. So Coul Coulomb blockade can be overcome by increasing the source drain to give electrons enough chemical potential difference to go onto the island and to leave. Um, and then uh, you can also uh, come out of Coulomb blockade by changing this V external. So you can see that uh, this chemical potential staircase has this minus EV external term, and the V external is a potential on the gate. And so this, uh, this entire ladder of chemical potentials goes up and down as you change the V external. So you can adjust V external in such a way that uh, you'll have just the right amount of energy to go in and out. And this corresponds to uh, a situation like this, where it costs you the same energy to have n and n plus 1 electrons on the island. Right? So from the point of view of charging energy, the two parabolas overlap here, and if you bias right here, and even at zero source drain bias, when the gate is set to this position, uh, it costs you the same energy to have n and n plus 1. It means that the electrons can come and go. They don't have to pay any energy for that. That means current can flow in just this one position of the voltage. OK, so if we plot this now in the space of our control knobs, which is gate voltage and source drain bias, then one of these things moves the staircase of levels up and down in the quantum dot. The other one changes this source drain bias. And now we can map out where we have current and where we don't. And it turns out that here, for example, is a point where source drain are small, this is zero. So source drain difference is small, it's th they are the same. Uh, and so you really need to have the same chemical potential as source and drain uh, to, to have any current. And so this happens at this point, and at this point, those are the points where the parabolas overlap in the Coulomb diagram. Um, now, what happens as we move along some of these lines? Uh, well, one of these lines is a line where we track 
with the source, we line up with the bottom chemical potential. And as we change the gate, so we move left and right here, we keep source aligned with the bottom level. And that means, oops, and that means current flows from drain to the source, right? These electrons can go in and just barely escape. So this corresponds to this line. So the negative source drain bias. And what this line separates is here we have Coulomb blockade and outside of this rhombic shape, which is called the Coulomb diamond, we have current. Okay? So the same logic can be applied to map out the other lines. So these four lines correspond to these four situations which are plotted uh, energy diagrams here. Those are the extremities. Inside in the CB region, uh, there are no chemical potentials in the quantum dot that are in between source and drain. And so we are in the blockade state. And outside, there is at least one, maybe two different chemical potentials through which we can hop across the dot. So this is how it looks in the extended uh, scheme. Um, we can, in principle, have a bunch of these rhombic regions, a bunch of Coulomb diamonds. Inside each of the diamonds, in the white re regions, we have a fixed number of charge on the island. Charges cannot leave, and they cannot go. Current is equal to 0. And at these points, which are called Coulomb peaks, or in the gray areas, we uh, have enough energy for electrons to travel across and overcome this Coulomb uh, charging effect. Okay. So um, I'm just going to skip the temperature uh, effects here. Uh, I'm going to talk for one minute about uh, what quantum uh, effects uh, add up to in this situation. So here is the uh, energy to have n electrons on the dot, but when the island is really small, comparable to the wavelength, then we should also think about particle in the box levels. And those uh, come as additional energy term uh, from having this confinement energy of particle in the box. And for small boxes, this term E and L, which are the orbital numbers N and L, uh, for, for a uh, potential in a box uh, can be as large or even larger than the charging energy. And then um, what this corresponds to uh, then is to make different peak spacings of this Coulomb blockade. So peak spacings will then depend on the quantum energies uh, in a quantum dot. And this is one of the also plots from uh, Delft uh, where they have measured Coulomb blockade in a, in a very small island, in a semiconductor island, like the one I showed you from the 2 deg. And so the blue regions correspond to no current, and white and red ones correspond to their flowing some current. And here they actually could down, count down to zero electrons. And this n equals zero large diamond is there because there are really no more electrons, and so this current will never reappear if you make the voltage more and more negative. There is really no more electrons. There are, uh, the, the, you cannot uh, lower the energy by removing electrons when it's zero. Okay. But in this direction, you can add some electrons, and you can see that diamonds change their size. Okay. So if we just had the Coulomb effect, they would all be equidistant at E squared over C. Uh, they would, uh, you know, we would have to provide this energy, and then we can add one more electron, one more electron. We have those parabolas. And here, we have them uh, changing size. In general, they shrink. That's because the island's getting bigger, and the confinement is getting weaker. Uh, but also, some of them stand out. They are large ones, like this number 2, number 6, number 12. So who can guess why these numbers? So what, what these diamonds tell you is how much uh, energy, how much energy you have to add 
to add one more electron, right? They're related to chemical potentials. And the uh, larger diamond, larger in this direction or also in this direction, means that you have to add more energy to add that electron, to add the next electron, sorry. So that's the orbitals? That's right. So this, these numbers, they are the orbital degeneracy. So the first level in a, in a particle in a box has a degeneracy of two because you have spin up and spin down. The next one has a degeneracy of six, right? It's like S, P, and so on. So the next one has degeneracy of six because it has degeneracy of three. Uh, depends on the, which box we're talking about, square or a, uh, kind of pancake shaped or a triangular box. They have different degeneracies. So for this box, the next one has orbital degeneracy of three plus spin. That gives you six. And then the next one has a degeneracy of four. Uh, sorry, of, of uh, six. Okay, so here is one last plot. This is for a carbon nanotube quantum dot. Okay, so this is Coulomb blockade in a carbon nanotube, and these pale regions, pale pink regions, are the diamonds. And uh, in a carbon nanotube, you can go on forever with this blockade, and every fourth diamond will necessarily be larger. And this comes for the same, uh, same kind of reasons because of, of this kind of energy structure, because you have two spin states, but you also have two valley states in carbon. Okay. So that means each orbital can host four electrons. And then it goes, when you go across, fill the orbital, then you need to pay that orbital energy to add one more electron. And then there is a large diamond. Okay. All right. So we stop here. Sorry for running over time. <laughs>